Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Senate Education. Uh, we are starting today is, uh, let's see, Thursday, the 28th of January. And we are going to pick up our work uh, today uh, by looking at S37. And this has, uh, we have the lead sponsor, <clears throat> Senator Polina with us. Uh, if you take a look through the agenda in general for today, we're focused on education financing on this really uh, secondary education level, uh, looking at a couple bills as well as spending some time uh, hearing from VSAC. For those of you who are new to the committee, it'll be uh, a great introduction. And even for those of us who are returning, <clears throat> their uh, overviews and updates are always uh, informative. Mm -hmm. So with that, Senator Polina, it's terrific yes, to have you in Senate education, albeit virtually, we of course would prefer to have you in the room but, Believe me, uh, I, would, I would prefer to be there as well. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to have you. So we will turn it over to you for a uh, bill introduction. Thank you. Appreciate it. For the record, I'm Anthony Polina. I represent Washington County. And we're going to be talking about S37, which is part of an ongoing effort to strengthen our state college system and actually make the colleges more affordable. And I'm sure you're going to be hearing a number of other bills in the same vein. So you, you guys, you folks really know the issue in terms of what the problem is. So I'll just talk about what the bill does as briefly as I possibly can. The bill itself does three things. First thing it does is it reconfigures the state college's board of trustees in an effort to engage more stakeholders in building the new system. So the new members would include faculty, staff, students, and others um, who would join the board in an effort to have more voices heard as we move forward. The board, the new board at once, is, 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 once established would do two things. Number one, it would design a new structure for the state colleges, creating a single institution and a single administrative team, protecting the individual personalities of the individual campuses, but a single unified system with a single executive officer and consolidating the administrative routes on the campuses and closing the chancellor's office as well. Um, you know, it's interesting because in between, in recent years, we all know how enrollment is down Faculty and staff have been cut by over 200 members between 2012 and 2018. And even with those cuts, even with enrollment down and the cuts to students and to the faculty and staff, the chancellor's office actually has, has increased in size from 29 members to 35 workers at this chancellor's office. So everybody's going down, but the chancellor's office is going up. And right now, from what we know, the deans and upper administrative level employees at the state college system are costing the system about $14 million a year. Folks hope that we could try to cut that number in half and save up to $7 million a year by having administrative efficiencies throughout the state college system. The other thing it would do is that this group would design a last dollar tuition program. You folks understand what that is. I'm sure you've probably talked about this already, but last dollar tuition program means that the state would pay for money for tuition after other state and federal monies are already allocated to the students. Um, we also believe that one of the reasons that what this would do is not only make the colleges more affordable, but it actually move towards increased enrollment. We've seen in states that have lower tuition or in Tennessee where they have a last dollar tuition program enrollment in the, in the colleges there has actually gone up because they've become more affordable. You know, we tend to think that the decreasing student numbers are because of democrat, that, that demographic uh, occurrences. But I think there's a lot of evidence, we know there's a lot of evidence that decreased numbers are not just about demographics, but they're related to increased costs. The more, costs, the more expensive the state colleges have gotten, the fewer students have applied to and went to the state colleges. And right now, 51% of our students go out of state to go to college. That's the highest percentage of any state in the nation. Of course, a lot of other folks don't go to college at all because it's too expensive. So this new board would design a last dollar tuition program to make the colleges more affordable, increase enrollment, and they would also have to recommend how to fund the tuition program. The initial funding would come from redirecting state need grants for the VSAC grants to in-state students only. You know, Vermont, you, we've been down this, we've had this discussion in the past, I'm sure you continue to have it, but Vermont is still the only state that allows all their need, need, grant, need grants to go out of state. My understanding is that in 2017, VSAC sent $5 million of our state tax dollars out of state. This is to help people go to college in other states. We understand what it's about, 
but no other state allows the grant money to be taken to out-of-state institutions. Vermont's the only one. So in 2017, they sent $5 million out of state. That was about 25% of their grant funds. So in terms of funding this, the tuition, last dollar tuition program, we would begin by looking at the $5 million that would be kept in state a year to the, keeping the VSAC money in state, $7 million or so in savings from the single administration effort. We would look at redirect, closing the chancellor's office, which has an expense that we don't need to encumber it with anymore. We would redirect job, they would look at redirecting job training programs as well to see if any of them appropriately could be uh, located on the state college campuses. They would be able to look at the marijuana tax and others. Um, they would, this group would then report back to the legislature on the, their plan to um, engage, their, their plan to um, restructure the state college system without closing campuses, without undermining students' ability to stay, um, stay, take, um, courses between colleges and reducing administrative costs. So I think that one of the most important parts about this, you'll hear other proposals about the need to lower tuition and free tuition and whatnot. This begins by reconfiguring the state college's board of trustees so that we have different voices involved in it. I don't think that you're gonna find too many of these other studies are gonna talk about reducing administrative costs the way this group would like to do. Now clearly they have, they have an interest, this, this, report, this bill, came out of an effort that you probably are familiar with. I hope you're familiar with it, but it came out of the labor task force from the state colleges. So you, you, I don't know if you've seen the report or not, but they put out a couple of reports. I assume they testified for the committee or at least- They did come in. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. So this bill is based on the assumptions and the research done with those folks. And it's, I think it's really important to give them a seat at the table while we have these discussions. I think they're more likely to take seriously the need for administrative efficiencies cutting down the higher paid administrative staff, the deans and whatnot, really taking a hard look at the value of the chancellor's office and why the chancellor's office continues to grow while the enrollment continues to shrink. So I think we'll get an honest appraisal of how to go about building a better system with these folks at the table. So that's what it does. It basically said, reconfigures the state colleges board and then instructs this new board to design a new single unified system and find funding for a last dollar tuition program. They would then report back to the legislature, of course, it would be our decision as to whether to move forward with these things. But we, they would, so they would report back to the legislature in December, I believe in this, this year. So I won't, I won't drone on any longer. I mean, that's basically what the bill does. Very, very helpful. Uh, committee, questions. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, just kick it off. How would, uh, so how would this interact, would this sort of negate the work of the uh, Select Committee on Higher Education, or, well, or not negate? I mean, this is this is sort of saying, listen, you're doing some work, uh, we know, uh, but we're also taking a, a, the same a, a similar step, if you will, simultaneously. Yeah, I was to say, I wouldn't negate it, but it would basically be um, focusing a different set of eyes, a much different set of eyes on the same problem. I mean, they're going to talk about reducing costs. They'll probably talk about, I, I, haven't, I haven't read that in a while, but most of the reports we've seen have talked about the possibility of closing campuses. I think these folks don't want to close campuses. And I don't think any of the reports that I've seen have really talked about taking a hard look at the chancellor's office and the high administrative costs that the, that, the, that the colleges have. We've talked about high administrative costs, but not in the same way that these folks would in terms of really trying to do away with the higher cost um, administrative, proceed, administrative personnel. I mean, $14 million, this seems like a lot to like, in terms of deans and high level administrative staff. I mean, you put the state colleges together, how many students are we really talking about? If you put, you know, Northern Vermont, Castleton, and together with VTC, I mean, it's not a lot of students. There's a lot of colleges and universities around the country that are larger than that, that rely on a single unified system. There's no reason why we have to have so much redundancy in a state college system. So I think we could, this, this would set a diff, put a different set of eyes on a similar problem. And I think come up with a more, in, more direct, inclusive response, which would say, this is where we can cut costs. We know this because this is where we work. This is our lives. Senator Hooker. Yeah, thank you. Um, Senator Polina, do you have any numbers as far as costs for the last dollar of tuition? Well, I don't. I mean, the report does. You can take a look at the report that the folks put together. 
they talked about, uh, I, I could dig it out, but they, I could also send it to the committee, but they talked about about $4 million a year to begin the program. To be, you know, the first year would be about $4 million to cover the last dollar tuition. And that's what we, that's about the same or it's more than less than what we would save by keeping the VSAC money here in the state of Vermont. Okay, thank you. Clearly that all needs to be looked at more closely. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that's a be all and end all of I think, you know, your, your question is pretty valid. How are we gonna pay for this? So one thing I'm wondering, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Hooker, did you have a follow up? No, okay. Have you had an opportunity uh, to, to look at what the competitors are, are charging? In other words, you know, I've said this before in committee, you know, where I live, it's the intersection of, you have the Albany area close by where sure. you're in Valley Community College. Cuomo seems to be lowering costs all the time. Charlie Baker also, you know, right over the border, you have North Adams, and then you have Keene State on the other side near Brattleboro. Do you have a sense of what what they are charging and what it might? I, and I have to say, I do have that some of that information, and I'll forward it to the committee. I just don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. It was submitted to me by uh, Chase Dobson, who's uh, doing a little uh, a little work for for me. I honestly don't know the numbers, but I do know that they've been doing their best to cut tuition costs. Particularly, they focus in New York. I think on depending on the family income. Certain people get the benefit of going tuition free, but what's what's happening is these other states are beginning to move quicker than we are, obviously in this direction, which means we're likely to lose more students to those states. So we're just it's, it's like we put off solving this problem; it's just going to get worse. We have a habit of doing that here in the state of Vermont. Yeah. No, and I think for me, and you know, we're going to hear from the state colleges a little bit later uh, as well. Just getting a sense of what this actual cost looks like, um, you know, for us to become competitive, honestly, you know, sure. I'm also curious to know what, uh, what students are graduating with now are from our state colleges, CCV, what does that average debt look like? Uh, I know that there are many institutions or some in the state, you know, I think everybody tries to keep it as low as possible. In other words, we don't want kids to have debilitating debt um, but I, I am concerned that we do have students that enter institutions, they don't finish, they get pulled in by a, an attractive uh, concentration or major that ends up not being what they want. So it's, uh, it, you know, the, the financial issue is an important one. And I, and I agree with you that, you know, to stay competitive, it, it, a lot of it's about cost. The other piece of this, I would say, Senator, and, and we haven't had much comment on that is, is what are people offering? You know, it's, it's great to have low costs. It's great to have, um, you know, uh, you know, minimize uh, administration, all that kind of, but what is it that our institutions of higher ed, particularly as we look at the state colleges and CCB, what are they offering? And I think that's the, the other piece of this um, sure. that, that again, we're not, we're not gonna really pull into, but it's interesting in all of these reports, few times, you know, you don't hear much about that. It's about savings, it's about this, it's about that, but it's not what the opportunities that are being presented are. And I think part of my fear is that we're, in, if we, as a solution to the economic problems we have at the state colleges, the more they cut programs, the less attractive the colleges are gonna to be to students around the state. So I think that's, that's something we need to avoid. I don't remember exactly, but I do know that Vermont has one of the higher debt Debt, I don't know what you call it, debt ratios of other states in terms of students coming out of state colleges. And I went once to, when there was a report that came out that showed that we had the highest um, kind of debt toward to income ratio. In other words, considering the debt that people come out of college with in Vermont related to the kind of salaries and income that Vermont families have, we had one of the more high, level, high debt ratios relative to income in the state. So, you know, we have to not only make sure the colleges are affordable, affordable relative to other states, but affordable relative to the folks who live here. Yeah, good point. I think uh, other questions, comments. Mm -hmm. If I may, just one other thing that uh, we're going to be hearing from VSAC later, and you did mention that um, you know we have about $5 million that 
leaves the state and goes with students to other states for higher ed. Again, I, it, it's something that I continue to, to personally struggle with, but again, looking at my region where for some students, the, the biggest opportunities really are in probably keeping the VSAC money in, I don't think would make a difference in terms of the incredible offerings just because of the size of the states and the amount of dollars that they're able to work with over the borders in, in uh, New York and Massachusetts. Um, you know, as I've said, Hudson Valley Community College, you, you can become an undertaker or you can do a reciprocal agreement with RPI. You know, I mean, it's, it, it really has become a large, I, I'm guessing 50, 60, 100,000 students university. Um, and those opportunities for some kids, it's just, you know, having these VSAC dollars is what, is what they need. And, and for Mass College of the Liberal Arts also, uh, again, just going over the border, mm -hmm. also because some of these institutions can, because of their financial capabilities, give these students more money, you know, to make it more affordable. I would say two things. One, at one point we uh, talked about, I don't know whether it was who was on the committee at the time, but we've had this conversation for a couple of years. We talked about the possibility of keeping the VSAC money in the state of Vermont, unless you were going to a college that was within 25 miles of Vermont or something like that. In other words, so it would apply to Albany that, as an example. I assume it's 25 miles, but something yeah, like that. Actually, that's a really good point. I'd forgotten about that. I remember you came to Senate Ed uh, when I was on this committee prior, and, and that's right. You did put the mileage piece in there, which, which, which I think was, was helpful. You also have to consider that fact that if people are going to a private school, let's say in, in New York or Massachusetts or any other state, you know, Ohio, you know, wherever they want, might want to go. If they're going to a private college and it's going to cost them 30, 40 or $50,000 a year. Yeah. You could argue that a thousand dollars from VSAC isn't going to make that big of a difference to whether or not they go. But if you're a Vermonter from the Northeast Kingdom trying to go to the Northern Vermont University, yeah. trying to come up with $12,000, $1,000 from VSAC may make a big, really big difference between you going to college or not going to college. So you have to look at it that way as well. I mean, having what kind of impact does that relatively small amount of money have on somebody yeah. who's trying to go to a state college as opposed to a private school out in Minnesota or something? It's a really good point. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. S uh, I noticed Senator Perchley has had his hand up. Oh, I don't know speak for him, but I, I, can, I can see you all. Well, I always feel honestly that when you're in the room, you're representing all of Washington County, uh, no matter if Senator Cummings or Senator Perslick are here. But we will take a question from Senator Perslick, please. Well, I just wanted to uh, point out to the committee that we did a lot of work, the committee last year, and I see Senator Hardy just joined us on basically trying to come up with a committee approach on the last dollar tuition program that Senator Polina is part of this bill. And JFO created a really nice spreadsheet that kind of gave it different examples of, of different proposals and how much they cost and how much the different grants are now. It was one of those great things that Jeannie always had in our folder when we'd enter the room. So we might want to see if they're still in the folders from last year or ask JFO to recreate that because it was a really helpful way if we're, if we're going to do the same work uh, looking at different options. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I'm glad you raised it. Uh, Jeannie, would you mind emailing that around to folks if it still exists? I can always loop back. Otherwise, I can, uh, can you repeat that, please? I can. I can, ahead, talk I can talk to you offline, Jeannie, about what document I'm talking about to, to send out. Great, thanks. Senator Polina, any other uh, comments? This has been uh, very helpful, very generous of you. What is your afternoon committee? Government operations. It's just right down the hall. <laughs> but we're, we're talking about, we have a whole menu of election issues we're taking up today, so. All right. The room's going to be packed. I'm sure it's going to be packed. <laughs> but oh, I, I, pre I, I do, I know you, I'm sorry. No, please I go ahead. I was going to say go over Turn Citizens United for us, please. Yeah, an easy, <laughs> an easy lift. No, I was just going to say, I know that you're going to hear different proposals this year about state colleges. It's something we've grappled with for years. And it's one of those Groundhog Day kind of things where it never yeah. seems to go away. But I really appreciate the fact that this committee is going to take it pretty seriously and as I said, I think that th this proposal, which is not that different from some of the others we've seen, but I think restructuring the board of trustees will, will make a difference. And I think taking a really hard look at the administrative costs will make a difference. And I think that we could have a single unified system with a single executive officer. Oh, I should mention the last thing is that 
the envision is that the single elect, the single unified system would be run by a single executive office, which would be located on one of the campuses. Mm -hmm. So you could shut down the office in Montpelier, which is an added expense as well. And why, why we don't really need a nice office in Montpelier for the chancellor's staff, although their staff continues to grow, which is kind of ironic since enrollment is down and staff and faculty have, we've lost two, 204 faculty and staff positions between 2012 and 2018. But the chancellor's office actually even grew by six six by six members. So yeah, it doesn't I, make any sense, right? Well, I can't personally comment on that, uh, given that I'm not sure, you know, with what the organizational chart at the chancellor's office is. I, I would certainly hope that if it is growing, it's looking at issues related to philanthropy, admissions, uh, helping the, the institutions out there that um, are on the ground trying to recruit students and raise dollars. But again. Um, I, I, I can't comment on that. Sure. Uh, other questions or comments? Senator Polina? Thanks for having me. Do it's good work. Anytime. Don't forget to get up and stretch once in a while. Thank you. <laughs> good to see <laughs> Thanks you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Mr. Demaray, would you mind seeing that Senator Hardy is here and I'm sure she is working on pressing issues in finance, would you be comfortable if we were to move to, for, uh, to Senator Hardy's bill introduction and then you take us through uh, both S37 and S29 after that? Of course. Yeah, Are you sure? Sure. Okay. Great. With that, uh, Senator Hardy, welcome back to Senate Education. Thank you. Thank Good you, Chair you. Campion. Great to it's have you here. Very exciting. Very it's, exciting. Uh, it's great to be here. And like half my mo morning committee is here, more than half. So it, it feels well, like you home. Must, you're on health and welfare? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and it's great to see Senator Perchlick, the, the last man standing from last year. And hi, Jeannie. I can't see you, but it's good to see you, your name. And, and Jim, you too, of course. Um, I miss Senate education. Um, and in finance, I left while they were talking to the st tax structure committee about education property taxes. So I'm a little antsy and eager to get back there and hear sure, what they're right So we're but, looking at S29 and act relating to the creation of the BSC tuition free scholarship program for Vermont. Residents. Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, for the record, I'm Senator Ruth Hardy from Addison County. I really appreciate that you're taking a look at this bill. Um, we did um, quite a bit of work on it last year in the previous version of Senate Education Committee. I'll just give you um, a few talking points and highlights from my perspective. And then I know Great. Jim knows the language really well and can walk you through the details. Um, so this bill started out as a bill um, that was specific to CCV and providing a scholarship, full scholarship for um, students to attend our community colleges of Vermont. Um, that was my focus last session after a previous version of the bill that Senator Polina introduced that would have been for all of state colleges had a fairly big price tag. So I tried to narrow it down to just focus on CCB. That being said, this year I widened it out a little bit um, to include um, associate's degrees and certificate programs at the Vermont State Colleges. So as it's currently drafted, it would include both CCV programs and some state college programs. They would have to be for students, both full-time full students and part-time students who are pursuing an associate's degree or a certificate of some program of some kind for you know some kind of professional certificate. So it wouldn't be just for the casual student who's taking a couple classes here or there. They would be full or part-time students pursuing a degree or a certificate, um, and they would need to be Vermont residents. Um, as it's currently drafted, um, it would um, include students whose um, full family income as defined by the financial aid uh, sort of parameters um, uh, would be up to $100,000. Um, so that's obviously a lever that you can pull to make it um, less expensive or more expensive or cover fewer students or more students, but that's where it's at right now um, and how we had it last year. Can you all hear me? Because I'm getting yes. weird internet. Okay, okay. Um, 
Uh, students would have to be in good standing, and this would be defined by the institution. So it wouldn't be something we would determine. It would be good standing with the institution, and that would both be academic good standing and also behavioral good standing. So they couldn't, you know, rob the bookstore and still get the scholarship or whatever. <laughs> That's a bad example, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, it um, would cover tuition only, and it would be a, a last dollar program, which is what I heard you just talking about. And Senator Perchlick's right. We went, we t spent a lot of time talking about the differences between first dollar and last dollar, and sort of something in between. Um, and uh, that becomes very complicated. Um, and students would have to apply um, for federal financial aid and fill out the FAFSA form in order to get the scholarship. As you may know, maybe you've heard in testimony, um, as a state, we leave quite a bit of federal financial aid on the table um, because not all students apply for financial aid. So this would require them to do so. And I think there are movements at the federal level to make that application easier. So hopefully this would help in that way too. Um, the, the definition of full versus part-time um, um, is outlined in the bill, and it would be for a limit of 60 credit hours, which is essentially what the estimate is for two years of a program. So it would cover an associate's degree. You could get um, 60 credit hours through the scholarship. And we subtracted out um, the early college program and the dual enro enrollment program. So. If students had participated in early college and dual enrollment and gotten credits through those programs paid for by the state, that would come off of this program so they couldn't double dip and get two plus years paid for. But um, And that's a way to sort of chip away at the cost of the program as well. Um, the other really important thing that the bill does as it currently stands is it includes four full-time equivalent positions for the Vermont State Colleges that would serve as academic advisors and mentors for the students who qualify for this program. Um, when I was crea creating this legislation, it was sort of in the off session pre-pandemic, um, and I worked pretty closely with CCB and the Vermont State Colleges and also the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, VSAC, um, to come up with what would be considered sort of a best practices bill. And one of the best practices when you look at programs around the country that have been successful are programs that provide academic support and advising for students particularly students who are first generation or low income students or don't have any kind of steady history of higher education in their family. Um, so those students really need the extra support and advising in order to stay in college or to stay through and get their associate's degree or to get their um, uh, career certificate. Um, so that's why this includes those four positions because that is considered a national best practice for this type of program. Um, and I, so as I said, I worked with those institutions to come up with what would be a comprehensive um, program. I, I read a lot of national um, sort of evaluations of other programs and there was actually a, a session at NCSL the year that um, I was putting together this bill about um, quote unquote free college programs around the country and what was successful or what wasn't successful. So I talked with a lot of people in other states and one of the states that was early into this um, and has a pretty successful program is Tennessee and they have a full t full mentoring program that goes along with their scholarship. It's actually run by private sector um, but it's it's pretty comprehensive and it's one of the reasons that they've been able to successfully do this program. Um, let me see. Um, I expanded it to include the state colleges this year because obviously this committee knows better than most that the Vermont state colleges um, are in crises and it's a big issue and wanting to um, support uh, their efforts to become more viable and to attract more students. Um, I believe that the um, the draft report that came out in December, and I don't think the final report is out yet, maybe it's due in a few weeks, from the um, 
the Commission on the Future of Higher Education in Vermont, or whatever fancy name we gave it last year, um, it recommended that we um, include at least $5 million in additional student scholarships for uh, Vermont State College as, and CCB students. Last year, the fiscal note on this bill was just about $5 million. Um, it has been expanded this year. There's not a new fiscal note as far as I know, although um, I have alerted JFO to it. So I feel like this could be a nice piece to include in the larger package that this committee and, and the full legislature may be considering for how we look at Vermont State Colleges and the situation. Um, I also encourage, so I encourage you to hear from all of them, obviously. UVM was also very supportive of this bill last year, as it was um, because they have a, a articulation agreements with um, CCV in particular. So CCV is a big pipeline for UVM for students, um, for Vermonters to go to UVM. And they find that if students are starting um, at CCV or the state colleges and then moving to, to UVM, they tend to have um, greater success in retaining those students once they get there. So UVM was also very supportive of this, even though it didn't directly give them scholarship aid. Um, they may have changed their tune, but that's where they were last year. Um, and I just highly recommend that you also reach out to, if you haven't already, you may have already done so, but to the McClure Foundation. Um, the McClure Foundation, as some of you might know, um, gave uh, did a program last fall where they gave a free class to any 2020 graduate of a Vermont high school. And um, they have a lot of data on the success of that program. And because of it, CCV bucked the trends of the uh, nationally where community colleges were seeing a decline in student enrollments last fall because of the pandemic. And instead, CCV actually saw an increase in their enrollments. Um, so the McClure Foundation has um, kept a lot of data on that program. And I think it's very relevant to this bill and the efforts to um, increased student access to um, our state colleges and our community colleges, which are majority Vermonters that go to these more than far more than 90%, I think, of the students are Vermonters who stay in our state to get their higher education and then fill some really critical jobs um, in our economy um, and uh, are just the kinds of students that I think are, are most critical that we reach with scholarship aid. So. That's my pitch and my high-level overview, and I'm happy to answer questions. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, you know, the McClure Foundation, it, it, we did have Joyce Judy in, uh, uh, I think now twice, talked just a little bit about it. The one number that would be interesting to see is we, we did hear that, yes, indeed, a lot of students took advantage of that one year, that one class. What we're still waiting to find out is how many went on after that. And so if uh, hopefully the McClure Foundation, you know, has been able to uh, do a little bit more digging, but I, I yeah, no, I, I certainly applaud the, the bill, the idea. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the entire committee, but, you know, I think we are certainly looking to try to do something in this regard, whether it's state colleges and CCB, just CCB, two years for enrolled students, or just to get students out there and into a class. Um, but that was very helpful. Uh, committee, questions? Uh, looks like I think we're going to allow you to go back to uh, finance. Okay. So, thank you, Senator. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good luck, everyone. Take care. Mr. Demaray, would you mind uh, taking us through the two bills? I don't think we have to go into too much detail, but uh, an understanding of both of them so that the committee can make an informed opinion. Okay, which would you like to start with? Why don't we start since it's uh, fresh, why don't we start with Senator Hardy? Okay, and Jane, if I can, can I share the screen? Go right ahead. I guess I can. Let's see. Uh, Hardy. Okay. So can you see that? 
pretty small. Yeah, it's pretty small. Um, let's see, does everyone have uh, access to this or do we want to have Mr. it? Let me see if I can increase the uh, view on here. Uh, Zoom. How is that? Uh, still pretty small. Why don't you just, uh, we can all use our iPads as best we can. Um, and why don't you talk us through it, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so for the record, we are, if I can, uh, we are reviewing, oh, me, um, we are reviewing S29, uh, which is uh, Sarah Harley's bill. And Jim, if you don't mind uh, just taking it off the screen, that way we can monitor people have questions and- Or oh, take it off the screen. Yeah, since it's not really working. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not sure why it's not working, but okay. There we go. Uh, okay. So does everybody have it open first? Yeah? Okay. All right. So for the record, Jim Danway, that's console. Um, so this bill, as uh, Senator Hardy explained, uh, creates a scholarship program. Um, and um, it begins with a number of definitions. So on page one, um, an eligible post-secondary post institution means any of the Vermont State Colleges. Um, on page two, um, an eligible post-secondary program means um, a curriculum of courses leading to a certificate or associate's degree. The definitions of full-time student gift aid, part-time student, um, quite, um, quite obvious here, so I won't read through those in a semester. Under C, so I'm on page two, line 17, it says the corporation, the corporation is BSAC. Um, the BSAC shall administer the program. Um, and it says uh, to qualify for a scholarship, the student must be a Vermont resident, um, complete the program application for each year of enrollment, complete the FAFSA form, which is the um, federal student aid application. Um, satisfy means test, so the family or the student can't have income above $100,000. And then um, has to um, maintain, good, maintain good academics, behavioral, good, sorry, good ac academic and behavioral standing uh, at the school and be seeking either a certificate or an associate's degree. This does not include, as Senator Hardy mentioned, a four-year um, certificate degree, uh, um, degree. So just a two-year degree or a certificate. Um, these have to make exceptions to, the, to these requirements as, as they feel appropriate. Um, on page four, uh, at the top, the uh, scholarships are awarded for a maximum of 60 credit hours. So as mentioned, that is about two years of school. And that can be spread out over a period not to see five years. So you can do a part-time over five years, you can do a full-time for two years. Um, and then uh, it says in B, line eight, that if a student has obtained a certificate under the program, that same student can seek an associate's degree as well provided that the uh, student doesn't exceed 65 hours on scholarship. And then um, BSAC is allowed to make exceptions um, to accommodate um, students uh, with medical or personal leave or students with a, a learning disability. Uh, the scholarship covers the cost of tuition at the school up to one academic year. So scholarships are yearly, so you, you apply each year uh, and it'll cover up to one, one, one academic year on a full-time basis, um, charged at the um, resident rate, uh, applies on a last dollar basis. 
and VSAC pays the scholarship funds directly to the college. Um, goes on to say that um, VSAC can adapt policies and procedures, uh, and there is no penalty. So if a student is on a scholarship and does not complete the coursework, there's no requirement to pay back uh, scholarship money. And then there is reporting. So um, uh, by November 15th of each year, there has to be a report uh, to you uh, on the effectiveness of the program. And then page six, um, going on to the funding, and there's a ESD scholarship fund being established here to fund this scholarship program. Um, as standard terms for establishing a fund, uh, line 1314 talks about the appropriation, which is for fiscal year 22, uh, $6 million. Um, and um, and then that would inflate thereafter. So this is an inflation factor for the annual appropriation going forward. Lastly, the bill on page seven talks about staffing at BSC and this appropriation uh, from the general fund for fiscal year 22 uh, of the amount of 400,000 for four, four full time positions, uh, specializing in student academic support and mentoring particularly for first generation students and other students in need of additional assistance. Um, this act would take effect on July 1 of this year and scholarships would begin to, to be granted for the 22-23 school year and thereafter. Thank you. Uh, questions? Seems pretty straightforward, comprehensive overview. Okay. Seeing none, let's move on to uh, Senator Polina's bill, which uh, is co-sponsored also by Senator Perchlick. Okay, so that is S37. And Correct. does everybody have that open? One more time. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. so um, S37 uh, reconstitutes the uh, Vermont State College's Board of Trustees and instructs them to develop a restructuring plan and the tuition program for VFC. So looking at section one, at the bottom of page one, the VFC, the corporation, currently has a board of 15 trustees. It will be increased to 19. Uh, page two, what's happening uh, here is that the governor appointees, governor appoints four, um, and those are being taken out, out so the governor would not have any appointees on this on this board. Um, there'd be four uh, trustees who are faculty members um, of BSC, um, and uh, that would. Oh, sorry, first trustees would be um, faculty of BSC. That doesn't make sense. So sorry, this is. Let's just say first trustees shall be faculty of BSC, uh, I believe. Um, and, um, and those are for, for four year terms. And then currently there's one student trustee and that would be increased to two. And then on the next page, page three, uh, line five, we have currently four legislative trustees, they would remain. And then there are four uh, self-perpetuating trustees chosen by the board that would remain. Um, and then one trustee um, would be a, um, a librarian um, and two would be appointed by the AFT. Um, the union, um, and two would be appointed by the Vermont State Employees Association. Um, I'm confused by bills because the corporation in this bill um, means the um, Vermont State Colleges, not BSAC, sorry. So I'm confusing my two bills on the uh, use of that term. So in this bill, corporation means uh, Vermont State Colleges. Sorry yeah. about that. No problem. Uh, and then um, 
And then um, the governor, on the next page, uh, section two, the governor is a um, member as well. Currently, the governor would be taken off the board as well. So the governor would not be on the board or have any appointees on the board. So that's the, the new constructive board is 19 people. Um, and then there's, there's a transition provision in terms of having people exit and come on. Uh, and then section four deals with the restructuring plan and tuition benefit uh, program. So it requires that the, um, the Vermont City College's Board of Trustees on and before December 15 of uh, this year, um, prepare a report uh, for you. Um, and that would take into account the report that uh, Senator mentioned uh, on how you have United Thing Vermont. Um, this is the Labor Task Force report. And uh, the board will make the following recommendations to you. Uh, first, how to increase access, collaboration, administrative efficiency, and innovation uh, through the, de the development of a single unified system of public post-secondary education that has a single executive office formed by the consolidation of executive and upper level administrative operations across the colleges and the elimination of the chancellor's office. Uh, the recommendation shall assume that the Vermont City College is showing me independent of UVM. Um, secondly, to design a last, last dollar tuition program for Vermont residents and how that program should be funded. And the funding recommendation shall uh, include uh, the requirement that BSAC cease providing scholarship tuition uh, for our state colleges, that's so called portability, and also would require. Uh, that administrative savings from the board's restructuring recommendation would be used for tuition. And then the funding recommendation, recommendation may include a portion of revenue from taxes on canvas, uh, reach direct appropriations for more force development programs, and include other funding sources that cover the board. And this act would take effect on passage. Thank you. Questions? Uh, my only question really, if you don't mind, uh, Senator Perslick, you were on the committee that passed out the um, Select Committee for Higher Education last year. And uh, you're, spon you're one of the co-sponsors of this bill. I'm just wondering, are there things that you're, you're seeing from the Select Committee, which I assume you're su you supported, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you, that you're not seeing um, done, or if there are ways that we would communicate, for example, if we weren't to take up this, are there things that you're not seeing that this bill is doing that you would like to see this subcommittee do, or the select committee? I mean, they seem to, there seems to be some overlap. So, yeah, yeah. no, def definitely. And I think when sponsored this beer bill with, with Anthony, Senator Polino, we hadn't seen their report yet. We just kind of okay. maybe, maybe their interim report was out. Um, so I think it was just an, an effort to have a different perspective that on the on the table to, to consider two different ways. You know, the select committee is, is deciding to recommend a, a combination of all but the community college. And this is a recommendation that includes combining the community college. And, and this one coming from more the, the labor perspective is trying to get more of the staff and faculty on the board. And that's not something that the, I don't think we even challenged them to really look at that or that the select committee is looking at those kind of issues about board governance issues. So it's looking at it differently. And the tuition part of this bill is just something that, you know, Anthony has put in several bills about free tuition over the years. And so the idea was, well, those bills never went anywhere. So maybe if this committee could come up with a proposal, that would be a way to, to get some support for it. So, but it's, I don't think, so I, you'll notice I'm a sponsor of both Senator Hardy's and Senator Polina's bill. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. It's both are just efforts together with the select committee's support to do something uh, to improve the affordability 
of our in sustainability or state college. Yeah, committee, I mean, uh, we can have a, a longer discussion after uh, we hear from today's witnesses, but I'm hoping uh, as we hear from people, you'll be considering what you might wanna do or might not wanna do with regard to um, broadening access, as I see it, to our state colleges, including CCV. Um, you know, what the work that the McClure Foundation and the generosity of the McClure Foundation, I thought was incredible last year and certainly showed that, you know, making it accessible, people will take advantage of it. Uh, and, you know, even though I keep asking the question, you know, what, what happened, you know, did students continue on? Even if it, they didn't, uh, to me, just taking a class, I think is great. You know, for them, for some people, it might've been exactly what they needed um, for a job or for, you know, their own interests, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, I put my cards on the table. I, I think for me, you know, giving people more access to higher education uh, at low to no cost, quality education is um, something I'm interested in seeing us do something on. And, and what that looks like, if it's continuing sort of the, the work that the McClure Foundation started or expanding it, uh, we, can, we can certainly have that conversation. Senator Chinden. I was just gonna say yesterday, I feel like I jumped the gun by offering concerns and then we took a lot of testimony. So I'll, I'll reserve my remarks as I think you just suggested to hear the testimony and then maybe reflect more on some of my, my pause points at the end. Does that make sense? Sure. I, no, you, you, I mean, you're welcome to, you know, one of the things that you are allowed to do, which I do constantly is change your mind. Uh, so uh, please feel free uh, if um, I, uh, yeah, I have, have a, so please feel free to just discuss or use this time in any way you'd like. Senator Terenzini, please. Thank you, Senator Kimbian. This, and this might as well not be the right time, but if we could we look at uh, Senator Hardy's bill for a moment? I have a question about that one. Absolutely. Um, I'm very familiar, very comfortable in the intricacies of municipal government funding. I'm still at a kindergarten level as to how we um, fund state government, all the intricacies and where the money comes from and goes to and all that. So I apologize for my very basic question here. But you look at, uh, I believe it's page six or seven on Senator Hardy's bill. And it says uh, for fiscal year 2022 and each fiscal year after an amount of $6 million shall be appropriated and transferred from the general fund to the fund. That $6 million uh, to be appropriated, that would come in form of we'd have to raise, we'd, in other words, in my mind, unless I'm completely wrong, we would be taking that 6 million, applying it to this, and then we have to raise that $6 million to put back into the general fund, or that $6 million has to be raised by taxes or the, the taxpayers of Vermont pay for that $6 million, correct? Jim, do you want me to take that or is that something? I, <laughs> I, I, happy to take that, but it, it's, yes, you have to um, raise revenue, obviously taxes or otherwise, uh, for the general fund, uh, or cut other costs. Or, uh, right, to, and that's the only thing I was going to add was, or cut something else uh, is, would, would, right. be, would be the way to do it, yeah. The only so thing, I, I, I guess, ahead, please. Go ahead. No, no I, was I want to say, I guess my thought process, this, this bill we're looking at, at in the scope of the state budget of billions of dollars, six million is a is to some a drop in the hat. But to me, I look at it as boy, six million dollars is a lot of money, especially in light of the pandemic uh, and everything else we have going on. So that's just you know how sort of the bill I interpret initially, um, and I I'm just putting it out there. Uh, but I guess I'll just I appreciate the answer, Jim, and I'll just hold my thoughts because I could ramble about this. But I see that number. I said, geez, that's got to come from somewhere, and yeah, I don't know if I'm loving the idea of it being right now. No, I, it, it, it's a great point. Uh, Senator Perchlick. Yeah, and you'll notice, and, and Senator Hardy mentioned, I think she did, or maybe I'm getting uh, confused with uh, Senator Polina's testimony, but the, the VSAC grants that go out of state are around 5 million. So was, when we were looking at it last year, we were trying to find a program that basically we could afford and whether that be some of the cannabis 
tax money or the BSAC portability grants. We were, we were, we were trying to find the money uh, to, to match up with our, with our goals. Because I think last year we started with one of Polina's bill that was just free college, which I think had a price tag of like 30 million. And, and we said, well, we're not going to find 30 million, but maybe we could find 5 million. And even though we talked a lot about where the money would come from, in the end, we send, we never sent the bill out, but you would send a bill out and it would be appropriations that would decide whether, you know, we could put $6 million in there, but they could just take it out. Or in fact, they will take it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just so uh, new senators know, uh, if it has, yeah, and any dollar amount, it's going to go down the hall and they're going to have a look at it and uh, they could make edits, if you will, uh, and the same with finance. Uh, so oftentimes committee bills, like if we were to take this up, they have more than one stop. And for example, if we were to vote this out today, which we're not going to, um, it would go down to approach and it would go to finance. Uh, it's possible, you know, another committee might economic development could say, hey, we want to have a look at this because it's related to economic development. You know, there are all sorts of, so it, it can be a long process. I just want to remind people of that. And um, I, I just, uh, yeah, I think these, these are questions that I have that um, I think, and I fully support us being remote for health reasons, obviously, but I think these are for, for freshman legislators, and maybe I speak for Senator Chittenden as well. These are questions I probably could ask in the hallway or the cafeteria or in between breaks. It's sure. just stuff that I don't, I think I'm at a learning disadvantage because I'm sitting in my basement, you know. I'm right yeah. there with you, Senator Terenzini. So can I just uh, pick up on what you just said, Chair uh, Campion? Sure. Did, did I hear you correctly that if we were to pass this today, if we as a committee were to move this out, it wouldn't go to the floor. It Correct. would by default, you would send it to finance and then ways and means, and they would have to get through their committees and then to the floor. And then it'd have to go through the house and then the governor would, would have to sign it, right? Yeah, so it would be on the calendar and then, uh, but it would it would be sent right to either finance or appropriations. And, and then there can be, just so uh, new senators know, there can always be a, a uh, Let's say, let's say there was something about a health class in there. I mean, for what, you know, Senator Lyons could get up and say, I want to see this bill. I'm the chair of health and welfare. And uh, it's something that's important to me and my committee. And, and you know, I, people would generally, I think when a, a colleague wants to see something, they respectful about it. So, so yeah, that, that is the process. And, um, and, and I, please, I, I really do hope you'll both continue to ask these questions. Um, it's great for all of us, and uh, and I, I think you're you're right. It's it's I too support us all being remotely, but a lot of this stuff would be settled, um, you know, or asked, uh, if you will, in in different settings. And for some of us, we're still you know everybody else, we're still learning, you know. So so yeah. ask away. Just, just uh, a, uh, Senator Lyons. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, Please. So what you have identified are are the weighing the weighing all the goods together and then making a decision about which ones and how much to um, fund. So if this, if we have a recommendation to make for uh, a workforce development uh, bill through our colleges, our institutions of higher learning, we just need to make a very strong case for it because in my committee, there might be a bill on, on child care and in natural resources, there might be a bill um, on environmental cleanup that each one having a fund. So it's a balancing of which good we put forward when and that ends up smack dab in the middle of appropriations. And what we have in the Senate is something called rule 31. So when you, when we, whenever you see a bill coming up on the floor. Um, so it could be this bill or another. And John Bloomer will say, or the Lieutenant Governor will say, um, uh, uh, based on rule 31, this bill is referred to the Committee on Finance or, or approach. So, so that, that's, that's what intercedes in any good thinking that we have. <laughs> And I'm happy to say on the record, it drives me crazy 
when we do send a bill to those committees and they do something to it. Uh, it's there's there is there, yeah they're not supposed to touch the policy. Yeah, center lines and I, yeah, center lines and I were <laughs> we were on finance together. And when you're on finance, you love to mess, but when you're not on finance, you don't. Uh, That's like right. People do those kinds of things. Um, so, great questions. And you know, just to take it one step further, when you know when 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 we don't agree with the house on something and uh, you know and at the end when there is a committee of conference when the senate sending reps and the house is sending reps to, to kind of hammer things out sometimes those people are from multiple committees so if we were doing this bill right now it's not as though you know i would say uh you know Lyons, Terenzini, and Hooker are going to go represent us. It might be that appropriations would want somebody there. It might mean that you know some finance would want somebody there as well, uh, representing the work um, that all of the committees did. Great. Okay. Um, if people don't mind, uh, we're going to just take uh, a ten-minute break. Why don't we stretch um, and come back? Uh, well, why don't we just call it fifteen and uh, come back at two forty-five? a little less than 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 